So welcome to the Treasury Elite uh, Leadership Series. I would like to thank all our viewers and members for supporting this noble cause of Treasury Elite, whose main objective is networking, knowledge sharing, and mentoring. Good afternoon, everyone. I am Abhishek Goenka, founder of IFA Global and Treasury Elite. We bring in world-class FX, Treasury, financial transformation, corporate finance for companies across India over the last 15 years. And today we have Mr. Shyam Srinivasan, MD and CEO, Federal Bank. Sri Srinivasan is the Managing Director and CEO of Federal Bank since 23rd September 2010. He joined Federal Bank equipped with experience of over 20 years with leading multinational banks in India, Middle East, and Southeast Asia, where he gained significant exposure in retail lending, wealth management, and SME banking. Mr. Srinivasan is an alumnus of Indian Institute of Management. He has completed his leadership development program from London Business School and served as a global executive forum top 100 executives of Stanchart Bank from 2004-2010. An administrator of national eminence, he holds key positions. Uh, he has been chairman of IPA committee on member private sector banks, member of committee of financial sector, legislative reforms set up by RBI. And he has been conferred upon the following recognitions and awards in the recent past the Greatest Corporate Leaders of India Award given away by the World HRD Congress, Exemplary Leadership Award from Rotary Club, etc. Welcome, Mr. Srinivasan. How are you doing today? Good, thank you. I hope you and your team and family is doing okay in rather challenging time. But yeah, we are okay. Thank you. Excellent. Glad to have you as a part of the Treasury Elite Leadership Series. And in the next 35 minutes, we would love to learn from your experiences. So, sir, uh, Whenever I talk to a lot of CEOs, entrepreneurs in India, across the world, you know, uh, I see that a lot of these CEOs, uh, uh, there's one common thread that at one point of time in life, they do not do this for the money. I would like to ask you, what is one of your single biggest reason for you to get out of bed every morning and get yourself to work? What is it that drives you today? Thank you. Good question. I think... Uh... If the answer is any different from uh, what others would have told you, then I hope I'm not lying. I think the biggest thing is you need an obsession. It is something you get fixated on and you have a dream or you have a, you have a bigger picture in mind <clears throat> and you are obsessed by it. In some sense, it has to possess you. So for me, when I took this job, um, it was about building this magnificent castle, right? And I knew if I toss a million bricks in the air, it can either land as a beautiful castle or it can sort of be all over the place. And and every day we try to build a part of that castle. So it is it is that obsession. Uh, it's been an, one long obsession, but I do quite like the fact that we're making progress. So yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's getting fixated on something and uh, wanting to make that happen and push yourself for it. So I think that's what keeps me going. And in some sense, that's what gets me to work every day. Excellent. Excellent. Uh, yeah, I mean, from the time I started working through till now, uh, it's been many geographies and uh, three different organizations, actually four. And uh, all roles have had their own set of challenges. And every time you move from one to the other, certain, my general theory of life is uh, take your next job not because you're unhappy with your current, but you're excited by the new. And I've been maybe lucky or fortunate that the transitions I made have generally worked out from a point of view of it's been progressive in nature. Uh, from the time I initially started right out of campus, I started selling computers for a couple of years. And then I went to Citibank and then to Standard Chartered and then to Federal. So these are my four jobs and uh, they've been in different uh, industry initially and then different geography and uh, at some point in time even different functions so in each of them needless to say when you shift from location a to b there is a bunch of learnings when you shift from doing a frontline sales job to a mid office back office job the characteristics the challenges are very different and those have been have had their own set of learnings and when i moved from foreign banks to uh, work in federal, which had a very different uh, sort of history and uh, uh, work culture, it had its own set of challenges. So, I, I mean, I'm, each transition brings about some adjustment, uh, some recalibration of your own 
expectations and most importantly telling yourself if you are good for that environment prove you are good in this also so it's a it's like a kick right you have to tell yourself you are if you are good for a you are good or better for b so that has been the thing now in terms of learnings uh, one learning i would say all across and i i do hope uh, i can say that with some credibility is be authentic right uh, don't try to be somebody else initially if in the early days you are suddenly taken in by somebody's style so you try to formulate many of your practices on that model but i think before long we have to realize that uh, authenticity is uh, is like seriously important it's like a signature right the so i would say authenticity the second is uh, which i keep telling my guys you have to be ready for you have to be thick skinned and uh, you have to be ready to be the pigeon and the statue and you don't know which one you're going to be which day sometimes <laughs> some days some days you can be the statue uh, so i think the ability to take the hits uh, so one is authenticity second is the pigeon and the statue the third i think if you do jobs which are <clears throat> if you have a longer horizon of professional life i think endurance uh, you have no choice but to be uh, running this for a very long innings and build uh, build all the capabilities that needs to keep that endurance going which actually when it's happening you don't realize having done this for 30 odd years you realize that that's a bigger characteristic than anything else over a extended period from so endurance authenticity and uh, willingness to be both pigeon and the statue at the same time well, excellent i mean uh, yeah. a lot of people who i was talking you know somebody given an example of a palm tree is like you have to be nimble like a palm tree you have to understand what your roots are you have to stand straight but be nimble the second point of yours which you talked about also mentioned a little bit on the ego you know that sometimes you could be a pigeon sometimes you could be a statue so you have to be pretty flexible very very rightly said sir uh, sir uh, uh, in terms of banking now what are the trends that you are seeing in indian industry and and uh, also uh, looking at the way uh, the liquidity is there in the system the transaction volumes are happening what what is the kind of a demand situation you are seeing in the overall business climate in india and where do you think we are headed sir no i think see uh, the most important thing abhishek in this whole thing is to not uh, start it's hard but it's not to start worrying about the fact that we are not growing at 6 7 8 9% okay. we have to believe that that unfortunately is a reset right we it's not something it's not you are doing my doing it's a un uninvited guest who has created everybody's life a mess in the context of that how does how do things improve how do you reshape everything personally professionally institutionally nationally geographically worldwide in any 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 measure you take in that context i would say yes there are signs of things uh, at least economically the worst is probably over uh, health and uh, safety of people there are challenges because this thing there can be a second wave there could be a third wave there are local pockets that are getting impacted some geographies which were relatively better off are getting impacted rural india can impact so all those things are there but i think many people have come to terms with the fact that we can live with this and move on right uh, isolate the problem and move on from being a uh, completely scared which we were in the early part of the covid so i took to that extent we have to break this into a health issue and a commercial and a economic issue i think the economic uh, scenario will improve uh, from hitting a really low point it will start bouncing up but like the rbi governor said it's not going to be one even paced everything growing at the same time you will see like a multi speed economy something grows faster something is catching up and something will take much longer in that context you will see opportunities crop up in each of them you know this morning you must have read there are 100000 refrigerators required just for storage of the vaccines now four months back or five months back this was not a conversation so suddenly you could you could potentially believe the refrigerator manufacturers are going to have a great time trying to you know get those products out so uh, you know the pps and the masks and the various sanitizers those are products which are not in our lexicon the business opportunities keep coming up uh, albeit not the same way the world was visualizing it 6 8 months back 
to my mind uh, the comeback will be multi speed will be uh, not something that you can easily predict but if you are able to read the signals faster and plug yourself like you said the palm tree sway and get into that spot you are in a better place so i would say over the next 6 months 9 months it's a lot of recovery uh, it's a lot of uh, smart opportunity sighting and that can give people an opportunity to uh, be a little ahead of the pack but i carry a little more optimistic view of the much further view of india uh, it, the world cannot fall apart the uh, i think resilience and the energy to win is there so between now and next year this time hopefully we are in a much better place and we have forgotten this deep fall and we are focused on a 5 6 7 8 percent growth from there where it will grow we can talk uh, there are a lot of opportunities that will come and so yeah i think that's what i would say no you also asked me about trends but we'll talk about it in a while if there's something in fact uh, i would completely endorse with your view sir so i keep talking to a lot of people in the industry and i was talking to one of the largest uh, logistics companies promoters yesterday he was telling me that his business is at 120% of pre covid level what they used to have in october last year you know so. the the flow of goods and services is phenomenal uh i was traveling and i was there for a short vacation and the o- hotel occupancy rates are at 90% which I was, were you were driving this was in this was in goa and uh, the taj was at 90% occupancy and the itc was almost 85% so uh they were presently surprised uh, that now things are coming back and you would not feel that you were in a kind of a covid scenario so apart from and and few of other com- uh, com- companies also whom we do business with i think post covid they became so alert with the situations that they cut down cost they focused on business uh, they changed their product line items and now some of the companies we interact with are doing business with more than 100% capacity of what they were doing earlier so they have all as you said they have all changed and uh, you know they have made the modifications which are necessary as we know humans we are very res- resilient by nature we have all changed and now i think uh, as you rightly said we are seeing a very beautiful upside from here uh, here i give a little more realism to it abhishek it's not uh, that everybody cannot repay it yes many of us uh, i mean if you take banking at the core of it you still are taking money and lending money right? yeah yeah i think the bigger message is uh, through all this there are opportunities emerging and uh, you have to be able to nimble and flexible and more smart to realign to that but the core has to happen still people have to produce uh, grow rice and wheat and vegetables and uh, you know so on and so forth so i think the only that at scale will bring back the economy to where we would need to be so uh, being smart produces one kind of outcomes but the ruggedness of the core also has to be raised to another level so yeah it's interesting yeah yeah during your career you would have interviewed you would have met you would have hired you would have got you have built great teams all together so what are the major areas or skills that you would want emerging companies uh, uh, so when i'm saying emerging companies the entrepreneurs in your emerging companies or professionals in your field to invest their time and what impresses you most when you are hiring people <laughs> Uh, i've said this very often i actually hire for will and less for skill right uh, to my mind skill to a some extent to a large extent actually is uh, you can buy it uh, you can train you can buy you can infuse it in various forms and frankly in today's world if you don't know google knows right so Correct. there's not much uh, i would give i mean if i have to wait it it's will that's uh, i put a huge price tag on that it's attitude uh, uh, it's it's the can do i will make my i'll give my last drop for it and i'm ready to climb mountains to achieve that and even more importantly a positive bias right In my mind if these are there there are any number of stories people with relatively less uh, natural talent by their sheer industriousness and their will will have you have done remarkable work so right. i think i think in my in my personal agenda it's will over skill and Agreed, i have seen across time uh, 
many who have flourished are who can go back to the endurance one who have the right will right attitude i think they last better so yes, very rightly said sir uh, you know i was i was interacting with mr anthony robbins the tony robbins if you know the yeah. coach and uh, i was taking one of his programs and he said there's a record which is playing in your mind 365 days a year 24 days 24 hours a day and all your decisions and actions in your life are actually motivated by this particular record as you rightly said that concept of endurance positivity a high level of energy both physiological and mental that i'm i'm going to do it once it keeps running like a roll every single action is positive but if you start with fear negativity you know and self doubt and that particular role keeps running in your mind then you go that particular side and your life i mean are you able to connect with what i'm trying to say our auto suggestion <laughs> correct sir talk yourself into it because it's not every day you're not going to wake up with the same spirit right so you have to you have to tell yourself that it's going to happen and you have to push yourself to make it happen and sometimes you have to as they say fake it to make it <laughs> correct sir uh, one of your biggest life changing experience and how did your life changed uh, post that if you could share one of your life changing experience personal your professional <laughs> for many married men it has to be marriage right like <laughs> <laughs> the professional part i think uh, like i said in my early years i was a front end sales uh, client facing jobs and uh, for most youngsters particularly if you're coming out of your management school you're doing all these glamorous front end jobs particularly in foreign banks uh, you get too too excited by it and you believe that uh, you are it it world top set your feet a uh, boss of mine in 1993 or uh, 94 or uh, no, sorry 95 but 7 8 years after i started working and i was doing reasonably well he told me that i'm moving you out of uh, front uh, front line job to a sales service operations and uh, collections role i revolted very significantly and i almost at the point saying screw you i is not working for me <laughs> I did I have a lot of thank thank him for and he said Sham just trust me and he was quite friendly and not very old, much older than me just a couple of years older so he had this uh, vision to suggest take this role do it for 2 3 years and you will thank me for the rest of your life because it will round you up in a manner that you would not have visualized so I think that choice after initial resistance to take roles which were not in my comfort zone quite early in my professional life uh, gave me an opportunity to see a business through multiple lens and even more importantly uh, gave you texture differently from what a sales job does uh, so i think i always say that to my younger colleagues uh, soil your hands very early in your life uh, do the dirty job first and take chances and go out of the sort of obvious routines so in my i do think in my early years uh, that transition i made from that to a job which was less client facing and more so called less glamorous actually when it was about time for me to complete that role and look for my next opportunity they wanted a person who has done business and middle and back office so i, I was only one who qualified which is why i got my next job uh, at a, when it was happening it was quite quite irritating and painful and uh, you know it was uh, not something that you sort of lusted for but in hindsight it turned out to be a great decision so correct, my correct. most of my younger colleagues is uh, take it uh, do the do the do the less glamorous a uh, more out of the ordinary jobs early in your life and soil your hands and usually it helps correct correct that that's a very 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 useful point and i'm sure a lot of these young people uh, who have been hearing this would get a message out of this that every time not a cushy private equity job or a private sector bank job though may sound as much cushy and uh, you know exciting but in a long term probably for an entire business role i think something which is more holistic actually helps so sir what are the biggest risk that you have taken in life and how do you feel about it right now see i don't know if it's a risk it was probably more calculated but uh, we were doing 20 years and i was only 47 48 when i uh, i left the confines of a foreign bank job 
to move to a role uh, which I took over in 2010 uh, as MD of Federal Bank. I won't say it's a risk, but it's a it's a shift in the entire mahal. Right? You were in one kind of business environment, successful in that, and you are shifting to a geography, to a business, to a much larger role at a stage in life where I could have a, probably made a little more money, worked in another overseas market. So I think that choice I made um, quite willingly and happily has turned out to be something that I have not regretted. Not that it has not no challenges, it has challenges, but I think it's something that I want to do. That's why I'm doing this for as long as I'm doing. And I still wake up to do this role excited. So I think that, uh, I don't know if it's a risk, but I think it's a decision which is slightly away from the normal choice one would make in a foreign bank environment. It's turned out quite uh, the way I'd like it to be. I mean, within this, there are many challenges, but that's par for the course. So I think, uh, again, it goes back to my earlier point, this doing stuff which is not the straight line, slightly out of the ordinary, and uh, taking a chance, taking chances probably worked for me. So one, one fact about you, what people don't know. If I tell you, I'm, I'm ready to be challenged, but I think I make the best South Indian filter coffee from first principles. I make the best filter coffee, which not many know. Yeah, I make filter coffee myself. I don't, drink it. I don't drink it, but I make it for others. <laughs> okay. So you don't visit the regular Matungas to have that morning filter coffee? I, I think I can make it better than them. Okay. I'm going to have a nice coffee content. <laughs> I'm sure your near and dear ones are fortunate to have the filter coffee at home. And lastly, sir, this is a very relevant question. How do you create and build a world-class team? See, if it was uh, easy, many would do it. <laughs> but I think uh, it's many things and for a long period of time. right? Uh, one is assembling a bunch of people who have uh, signed on to the common purpose. Second, is uh, which I said in the recruitment phase is who have will and are not prima donnas who believe that uh, they have shortcomings but are willing, willing to sort of work their backside off to make it happen. Third, I think uh, if you, if everybody believes that there is no secret agenda and generally purpose is consistent and uh, uh, and uh, there is a reasonable fairness of practice. Most people shared their inhibitions and put their best forward. The rest is, uh, I think, a bunch of situational things. But these are three things I would say is consistent across time and organization. The problem in most organizations, including mine, and is that unless you're a promoter who can have 10, 20 people with you who are journeying with you for 10 years, in many other organizations, people come and go. So the teams are, you know, somebody maybe in their late 50s will retire in two years. So every three years, your team is refreshing. Correct. So to that extent, all that I said has to be crunched in a shorter period of time. And you need people to be equally excited about the opportunity uh, for the length of time that they are in the role. So th therefore, I think building teams should not be seen as the same members in the team, should be seen as same philosophy of uh, how an institution is run. In my 10 years as MD, I have had uh, more than 70 people who have been in as part of my senior team over these years. That's because every three years somebody churns out, right? Somebody is either retiring or has moved on or has quit or whatever. So the consistency of the team may be only three, four people. The nucleus may be only three, four people. Correct. Over an extended period of time. But I think what is important is the philosophy of how that team uh, self-regulates itself. How does it find common purpose? And how does the uh, engagement with one another is fairly transparent and uh, all carry the same burning aspiration? So I think that is important. Um, and, you know, situationally you do stuff which is relevant to the institution and the occasion. In fact, very rightly you said, you know, if you're in a super high growth phase, where you are growing at a phenomenal stagger, the core team stays with you for longer. That, that's a trend that we have seen while talking to a lot of promoters because the vision is very, very strong. The growth is very strong. There's a, there's there, there isn't for every, everybody. But as soon as you flatten out or you are growing in a slow pace, across companies, we have seen a lot of churning happening. And because of which, uh, despite the best of philosophy, 
the best of core the best of focus uh, you know companies struggle i mean this is seen i'm seeing this across when i talk to promoters what's what's your feeling i mean am i making sense when i'm talking that you know with companies you know which has been world class companies who have grown it's, phenomenally it is very true and i think we must uh, we must at least in my mind redefine what the team and the duration of the team is if you take the indian cricket team say dhoni or virat or whatever or even any any good franchise at a point in time there are only three four players who are consistent over time the team is considered good today if delhi capitals or earlier day csk there was only one dhoni and a couple of guys the others are some uh, rituraj gaekwad and somebody else mohit sharma who comes and goes but what is keeping the nucleus of the team is different from what is keeping the team successful and this mahol of the team so i think there's a big difference and we often think all are going to be the same it's impossible impossible you know all fingers are not the same size right so i think we have to understand this in a context of uh, the leader and maybe two or three or senior colleagues who are the nucleus who have the same eco sort of same desire and the same cultural ethos are bringing together people are able to inject people into this puzzle keep them together sometimes you have to eject out people for the good of the team correct not because they're doing badly because you want to bring another team into this to bring a new culture and send this people to go and impregnate this thought elsewhere i have a personal philosophy I don't let my executive assistants be in my office for more than 2 max 3 years i move them out uh-huh. uh i don't want them to get believing that life is easy and sitting in the md's office they can get everything done so they have to go out and get real business doing and i don't like for anybody to grow roots under their feet and believe that's a sort of an entitlement correct. Uh, correct and i think that keeps many youngsters on their feet they, they make their best and then they go out and shine elsewhere correct sir correct the, the big in comfort zone never helps in long term so that was a very very useful conversation with you sir thanks for taking out time your perspectives about building up a team perspective about the economy perspective about how young entrepreneurs and young leaders in the professional business should behave and you know look at other non juicy part of the business also as a lucrative opportunity because that's going to help you in the long run i think those are very very uh, useful insights and i'm sure all the people who have been listening to you today but i've definitely got some of the very interesting points out of this conversation once again thank you for your time and i wish you the entire team the bank and your family a very very brightening days ahead i would say so thank you sir thank you so much